Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thanks for tuning in to Talks from the Tide Pools. I'm Kate, and I'm streaming live from Seacoast Science Center in Rye, New Hampshire. I'm excited to introduce you to your Tide Pool naturalist for this evening, Darren Clevesy. She's going to be using our indoor tide pool here at the center to show you all the cool creatures you might find out in the tide pools and even share some pro tips for tide pooling outside on your own. As Darren talks us through and shows us some of these cool critters up close, please feel free to type your questions right in the chat and we'll save some time for Q&A at the end. So let me bring Darren on here. Hi, Darren. I'm so happy you're here. Hello. And Hi, I'm happy to see you guys or virtually be here with you guys today. Again, my name is Darren um, and I am right here at the touch tank inside the science center. Awesome. So I will be able to see the questions that you guys pop right in. So just like Kate said, if you have any wondering thoughts or even just some comments, please go ahead and write those in either if you're watching from Facebook or YouTube today. And I'm just gonna get right started. So right next to me, is a bunch of different tide pool critters. And I'm gonna tell you all about them. But before we do, I wanna show you a cool video of the rocky shore and the tidal zones so that you understand where we're talking about and where you can find these animals. Awesome. So what you're seeing here is our salt marsh right here at Odeon Point State Park across the street, across the ways from the Seco Science Center. And you can see those drastic time lapses of the tide going in and the tide going out. Throughout the day, uh, six different or four different times every six hours. So there's going to be two different low tides, two different high tides, and they're always interchanging. So when you're out about it, either here at Odeon Point State Park, outside my windows right here, um, outside the Seco Science Center, or even just al all along the rocky coast of New England, you're going to find all different kinds of animals, all different life. You're gonna see them throughout the rocks. So you're gonna see them all along, more so on those darker wet rocks that are leading towards the ocean. You're not gonna find much up on those whiter, drier rocks, um, because the ocean only goes as far as what you're seeing in this image, that dark line, and it's going to stop right there and then recede back into the ocean for low tide. Awesome. All right. And you can go tide pooling any time of the day, but I'm going to recommend that you go during low tide specifically. So you're going to want to research where you want to tide pool first and then do some research on what the tide is for that specific location. Um, you can find animals at high tide, but it's mostly going to be, my friends, the periwinkles or dog rocks. Um, you're also going to probably see a lot of barnacles as well. So we're going to start by talking about those guys first, and then we're going to go right down the tidal zones and finish with one of my favorite ocean creatures. Awesome. So first and foremost, we're going to talk about my barnacle friends. And I don't have a physically living barnacle to show you at the moment um, because the barnacles are wanting to be underwater and sometimes you'll find them up on the high tide mark on rocks um, but what I have here are two barnacles that are not living um, if they were living you would find the animal inside of those holes that I'm pointing at but barnacles are sessile organisms which means that they stay put wherever they basically glue their heads. Um, so that could be a shell, like the scallop shell, for instance, or that could be a humpback whale, that could be a rock, or that could just be the ground, the ocean floor. All right, so I'm gonna show you this cool video of barnacles filter feeding. This is how they eat. So when they are underwater, they are very active. And they're gonna, you're gonna see those little feet of theirs filter feeding, and they're grabbing on to phytoplankton and zooplankton that are in the water. So I definitely challenge you to go low and slow when you're on the rocky shore. When you go low and slow, not only are you gonna keep yourself safe and the animals surrounding you safe, but you're also gonna be able to see really cool um, things just like you just saw in that video. You're gonna be able to observe more life than what you would if you were just very fast about it and trying to find as much as you can. 
you're going to be able to find a lot by going low and slow. Next, you're going to find a lot of periwinkles. So that's my friend right here. Periwinkles are a type of sea snail. And let's see if I can focus on here. Do, do, do. Awesome. They're a type of sea snail and they're actually herbivores. So they're actually vegetarians. And I can show you how fast this guy likes to move around. They use their two feet and, or not their two feet, I'm sorry, their foot to get around, their big foot. And you can see their little antennae walking or moving around to sense their surroundings. They live in a shell so that they protect themselves from potential predators. And when you see them on a time lapse, you can tell they definitely get around. Awesome. Sometimes people like to hum at them to see if they come out. So that can be something that you can do as well. Something, an animal that looks similar to a periwinkle, but is a little bit different, still a mollusk, still a sea snail, is the dog whelk. So dog whelks are going to be, in this sense, a little bit lighter brown, but mostly they're going to be white. And they're going to have a much pointier tip on their shell than the periwinkles. The periwinkles are going to be a lot smoother. Um, they get around just the same, um, but instead of being herbivores and just eating seaweed and algae, like the periwinkle, they are going to actually eat other mollusks, such as the periwinkle. So you will find that these guys are carnivores, right? They eat another animal, so they eat meat. What's really cool on the beach is if you find a empty periwinkle shell, there's no one in at home in this one, and you find one that has a perfect circle or almost perfect circle. If you find any of these, not only will they be good to make for jewelry, for a necklace, but it's actually what happened when the dog whelk went and ate this periwinkle. So they have, you can see my dog whelk starting to come right on out. So that's the body, that's its foot, and you can start to see a little antenna, antennae, right there. And they are gonna actually take out their drill-like tongue. It's called the radula. And they're gonna drill right into, in this case, a periwinkle shell. And they're gonna slurp out that body and eat it on up. So they aren't friends necessarily in the animal kingdom but they do look similar. So you're gonna find those all over the place before you even get your feet wet. With that being said, when you are going into the tidal pools, you wanna make sure you have a sturdy pair of shoes with you. Closed toed is preferred to help protect your feet, um, but really what's most important is a sturdy soled shoe. So making sure that you are not slipping amongst the seaweed and the rocks. And if you're going low and slow, then you should not have an issue as well. Of course, throughout the tidal zones, you're going to find seaweed, all different kinds of seaweed. And seaweed is super neat and also really important. So I, I also challenge you to take a moment to observe closely some different seaweed species. You might find some bladder bubbles, some air bladders so that they float up top. You might see them dried out all the way up at the high tide mark. You might even find an animal trying to eat some seaweed. So again, I mentioned to you that the periwinkle is an herbivore and likes to eat seaweed and algae. But I have another friend right here that I wanna show you that also is a vegetarian, an herbivore, that likes to eat seaweed and algae species. Get him right now. My sea urchin friend. So my sea urchin friend looks kinda scary, maybe intimidating to some with when you're just looking at it. But as you can see, I am holding it and I am A-OK. -okay. So it does kind of look like a porcupine, maybe to some, um, but it's totally harmless. I wouldn't say it's harmless if you were to step on it full force and not know where it was, that would probably hurt. But holding it and touching it is totally OK. I will mention though, that if you're going to hold any animals in the tide pool, that you put them down right in the water um, under the water in your palms, just like this, okay? In the water though. Um, most of our sea creatures don't like to be out of water for too, too long. And if we wanna make sure that they're safe, we want to put them close to the water, if not always under the water, so that if we accidentally get scared or drop it for any reason, it won't get harmed by us, okay? 
If we look at the other side of the sea urchin, you're gonna find its mouth, which has a very, very fancy name called the Aristotle's lantern. Um, it has five teeth, ironically, because it's not, it's not a carnivore, it just uses those teeth to munch on seaweed and scrape off algae. And it has radial symmetry. So I'm not sure if you can see it very clear here, but if you were here with me in person, and if you find a sea urchin on the tidal pools anywhere, you're gonna see that it almost looks like it has five points. It almost looks like it has a star shape in between all of those spines. You're also gonna find between all those spines, tube feet. And the tube feet are super neat to start to watch when they're underwater. They're not gonna show you any when they're above water. Speaking of which, I'm gonna put my sea star or my sea urchin right back in the water so that it's nice and healthy and not getting stressed. But you can see all those tiny two feet coming out from their spines and they're gonna use those for protection um, to defend themselves from predators. Um, and they're also gonna be able to use those to help them stay safe in their environment. So the rocky shore constantly has waves, um, wave action around it and in it. And to stay put, it's generated and it's adapted for thousands of years, these two feet so that it suctions on, kind of like a toilet plunger, if you wanna think of that. But tiny versions all over its body. Its relative is the sea star. And the sea star has two feet as well. So I'm gonna grab my sea star friend but I wanna do so very gently so that it doesn't get harmed because of its two feet. Ah, and my sea star friend found a mussel. Its favorite food is mussels, blue mussels, but really any mollusk is my sea star's favorite food. All right, and there it is. So what do you notice is different about this sea star versus maybe any of the other sea stars you've seen in the wild or in my touch tank here at the Seco Science Center, if you've visited before. I'll point to something odd going on right down here. So if you notice, there's one full arm, two full arms, three full arms, four full arms, and then you have this little tiny stub going on. And that sea star has a superpower. So it's actually regrowing its limb. So if a sea star gets in a fight with, let's say, a crab, and a big enough crab that it can pull off its arm, the sea star is actually gonna tell its body, it's gonna send hormones throughout its body, just let go. I wanna be able to survive. I need my whole body to get away from this situation. So just take my arm and call it a day. I'll regrow it later. It's not an easy process, so we'd never wanna do that for fun. And we always wanna make sure again that we're holding animals we find in the tide pools in our palms, very, very gently under the water um, because it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy and time for them to regrow their limbs. So when we look at the other side of the sea star, you're gonna find just like the sea urchin, a lot of different two feet, hundreds of different two feet on each arm waving at you. Again, tiny little plunger-like legs that help them suction onto rocks, the substrate, and also to help them eat their muscles. So they will take all their arms and all their hundreds of tube feet, they'll wrap themselves around a muscle or whatever they want to eat, and then they're going to pry open that muscle using all that, that strong arms they're then gonna take out one of their two stomachs, which is really gross, almost out of their belly button, the center of their mouth on the bottom. They're gonna use stomach acids and digestive enzymes, and they're gonna slurp that food all around. They're gonna make it almost smoothier milkshake texture, and then they're gonna slurp it back in to their second stomach to be able to eat it and digest it. Do you guys at home eat like a sea star? Awesome. All right, I'm gonna find us our crab friend, but actually before we do, I'm gonna show you the blue mussels I've been yakking about. So I have a bunch of blue mussels right here and they are all stuck together by bissel threads. And these bissel threads 
really help them hold on to each other. And again, uh, because that wave action out there in the tidal pools, they can they don't want to necessarily go too met too far from where they want to be. So they can also help them stay in a, a specific location. So why do you think sea, sea, sea animals, blue mussels in this instance, want to be clumped all together and hold on to each other? Well, maybe if let's say we pretend we're a seagull flying from above, hopefully the seagull will maybe mistake this pile of blue mussels for a rock. So it's almost, it's for camouflage purposes. And so again, you can kind of see up close, we can maybe get these up close for abyssal threads. All these threads. Awesome. All right, now I'm gonna move on to my crab friend, who is somewhere. Here he is. Here he is. Awesome. So we have my friend, the green crab. And friend is a nice way of putting it. The green crabs are invasive species. So I don't love these ones as much as I do our native species. Um, invasive species means that an animal came over or came somewhere from a different location where it wasn't necessarily originated. So our green crabs, if you think of green for Greenland, came over from Europe a hundred years ago, almost. And they have been here ever since. In this case, and for most cases, it was by accident. Um, this one came over in ballast water of a ship. So the ship was coming from Europe to America, filled up its ballast with water, and some of these guys got in that water. And then when they came over to us and let that water out, these fellas went out as well. So crustaceans are a, a really fun find on the tidal rocks, the tidal zones. And there's a couple ways that you want, want to hold them if you do decide to hold them so that they don't pinch you and also so that you aren't accidentally flinging them or dropping them because you're scared. So the one way I am holding it right now is with two firm fingers. My thumb is on its back. My pointer finger is on its tummy. And if you can see that, its pinchers aren't pinching me. Hanging out and I'm able to observe it more closely. I'm able to see that it is a greenish color and brown. I'm also able to see that it is has missing two legs. So if you notice on this side right here, it has its four legs, four walking legs, plus its upper claw. And on this side, it's supposed to have that as well. Um, it's actually missing two. So crustaceans are supposed to have 10 legs in total if you include their top two claws. They're gonna have two eyes. You might start to see them making bubbles at you when they're above water. But again, not too much above water. Try and hold it in the water or above the water so that if you drop it. And the second way to hold it is right here, almost right behind its shoulders, like this. My preference is the other way, but a lot of people hold them like this. Again, you can see that this pinchers are in front of me. It's not pinching me and I can't be pinched. I feel safe, um, which means that this animal is gonna be safe so that I, I'm, if I'm not scared, I'm not gonna drop it, right? So. Another cool thing about crabs, specifically this green crab, is you can tell it's a green crab not only by its color, but if you count the spikes leading up to its eye on each side, and it will have five spikes spelling out green. So G-R-E-E-N, green crab. Awesome. I also have a tinier crab you might see more so on the sandy side of Odeon Point State Park or sandier substrates. Who is that little fella? It's the hermit crab. So hermit crabs, there's about four different species that you'll find out on the rocks or out and about. Again, mostly in the water. 
And again, mostly in the sandy beach. So Frost Point side of Odeon Point State Park. And they will take dog whelk shells or periwinkle shells and find their little home. And they're always fun. And last but not least, I'm gonna show you my lobster friend. The grand finale. So lobsters are super neat and one of my favorite ocean animals, especially in the tide pools. And my lobster friend is banded here to keep itself safe. So when it's not being held by me, it's actually gonna be in a tank with other lobsters. Um, and lobsters are very territorial animals. So in order to keep themselves safe and not injuring each other and fighting with each other, we keep them banded. So if anyone's wondering that, that is why. This lobster is really healthy. And if you notice, is all brownish, reddish, almost rusty, orangish. And that's great because that means that this animal is gonna be able to camouflage perfectly in the Gulf of Maine. It's a natural environment. You may have seen or heard of lobsters being all different kinds of colors, maybe a bright blue lobster or maybe a bright orange one. I once have, had, have held a blue lobster that matched this shirt. But why do you think that that wouldn't be good? Why would that not be a good thing for a lobster to be? Well, it wouldn't be able to camouflage, right? So this one is gonna be able to be able to hide from predators easier, go in its den, not worry about too much. Whereas a blue lobster is not gonna find much in the Gulf of Maine that it can uh, resemble or hide against. My blue lobster friend wants to say hi to you. It feels like it should say hi to the camera. So what you're seeing here is my blue lobster friend actually technically trying to swim away from me. So I'm gonna let it calm down and just give it a little hold on its bum. But what I wanna show you are its swimmerettes. So these swimmerettes are what helps it swim. And so when you see it waving at me or swimming away, it's really strong. And they swim backwards away from their predators. So it's gonna go this way and it's gonna be facing whatever's trying to eat it so that it can still defend itself, right? And they're really fast. It's almost like a jet propulsion. But these swimmerettes are the reason why they're so fast. It really helps them. Female lobsters would hold their eggs down here and keep their, their eggs safe, thousands of egg, tiny eggs. But this lobster, if we look closely, is actually a boy. So you can tell a lobster is a boy or girl by looking at the top two pairs of swimmerettes. So right up here, where my fingers are. And this one is a boy because it's not as soft and feathery as the other swimmerettes. So that's how I know it is a boy. If it was a girl, it'll look and feel exactly like the rest of these swimmerettes. Lobsters, just like crabs, right? They're crustaceans, so they are gonna have 10 legs, or they should have 10 legs. So let's count with me here. We have one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then the top two claws equal the 10. We look closely at its mouth and its antennae. You can see its eyes. And there's a bunch of hairy like filaments right in here. I'm not sure if you can see that very clearly, but those are their taste buds and how they get help eat. What's really interesting about lobsters, just like the sea star and same with the crabs, is that if they lose a limb, they can regrow it back. Not easily. It will take time and a lot of energy, but they can and they will. So we have a fully legged lobster here. Very energetic, as you can see, and super healthy. Awesome. So if we have any questions, I would love to be able to answer them. Um, or if you have any comments that you would like to share with me, statements. We're going to put those lobster, that lobster back in its bin so it's nice and happy underwater. Not swimming away from me anymore. And with that, I'll just end by saying that tide pooling is a great way to learn about the ocean. It's a unique little mini world right at our feet. Um, and if you spend enough time there, you'll get to see so many neat things um, and walk away really, really happy. At least I do.
So I hope you get out at Odeon or elsewhere on the rocky shore. Bring title, uh, go tide pooling. Um, and then just always remember that you are visiting their home. So don't ever take anything home with you. You want to leave everything there. Um, unless you want to help out and take trash home, that's something you can take with you. Um, other than just photos and memories. Have fun exploring. Taryn, thanks. That was awesome. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in tonight. I hope you all learned something new about the tide pools and the really amazing biodiversity that exists in them. Um, thank you again, Jaren, for showing us all those cool critters. Um, I just want to mention tonight's program is one of part of our week-long World Ocean Day celebration, and that's running from June 1st to June 8th. Um, I encourage you to check out our website at www.seacoastsciencecenter.org to see our full lineup of World Ocean Day activities and events. You can learn more in the menu under events. And as you all may know, Seaco Science Center's mission is to inspire conservation of our blue planet. And so World Ocean Day, an international effort celebrating the important role that the World Ocean plays in our lives every day is a very special event to us. Um, if you support our conservation education efforts, including school and community events and programs, please consider becoming a member or donating to our nonprofit institution. You can learn more about membership and donation opportunities on our website. And thanks again for tuning in. We hope to see you later this week for trivia, beach cleanups, seal webinars, family tide pulling programs, and more. And our little sea star is saying goodbye. So everybody have a great night. Um, we'll see you next time. Bye.